everyone. I'm Shruti Ram. I'm a breast imaging faculty at Brown University, and I'm happy to be here moderating this uh, Health for the World Grand Round session. Um, Dr. Kwan Nguyen is our speaker today. Uh, he's senior faculty in the breast imaging division at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. And he's going to be um, uh, speaking about screening images and BIRADS. Some background on him. He is the president of the Health for the World Baylor of College Medicine chapter. Uh, he's received numerous teaching awards, um, including University of Texas System Distinguished Teaching Professor Award and Outstanding Faculty Leadership Award, to name a few. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this talk. Um, before we get started, though, I just want to remind everyone to please turn in any questions you may have into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Nguyen now, and please enjoy the talk. Thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's uh, an honor to uh, kind of present today to everyone around the world. Um, I think this is a, a kind of health for the world is uh, is great uh, using technology to connect us all from around the world. So, um, you know, thanks to Dr. Rahani uh, to set this all up, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ram, for moderating, and uh, Azi, um, kind of being the administrator for today's talk. Uh, so, I'll get started. Uh, you know, today's topic is uh, screening mammography. And BIRADS, which I, I know they, you know, news around the world also in Europe, I know they kind of, you know, follow the BIRADS as well. So I want to kind of give acknowledgement uh, to where I trained in fellowship. A lot of these slides, uh, basically almost all of them have come from the University of Washington where I trained. So uh, just to keep people engaged here, I have a couple of, uh, you know, questions to see, you know, what you already might know. Um, and at the end, you'll have the answers to these. Um, so multiple choice here, which statement about breast cancer in the US is most correct? So how many you know, will be diagnosed in their lifetime? Um, so take a look at that and uh, we'll get the answer later in the lecture. Question number two, what percent of breast cancers do screening mam mammograms miss? So, you know, Screening is not always perfect. You're not gonna catch everything, um, but you wanna use something that's low cost that is gonna help you to catch um, most of the time, uh, you know, what you're looking for in this case, breast cancer. Now the question here, so there's a lot of recommendations by many kind of different, you know, kind of uh, organizations, uh, whether it be radiology, um, you know, uh, gynonc um, and, uh, breast surgeon. So, uh, but what does the American College of Radiology recommend uh, as a starting age uh, to start getting uh, screening mammograms in non high risk patients? So, and, you know, most people get this, most people would get very confused with this because there's so many recommendations out there. So, a screening mammogram consists of how many views of each breast. So, in each breast, how, you know, um, you know, in the USA, how many, you know, um, views of each breast will you take in a screening mammogram. And think about this, so do you know that um, which of the following cannot be detected with a screening mammogram? Um, so on a screening mammogram, can you see masses? Can you see calcifications? Can you see distortion, post-surgical changes? Um, can you see enhancement on a screening mammogram? So think about that. And, uh... All right, so um, breast cancer, you know, uh, one in, uh, in eight women uh, lifetime will get breast cancer. And so you know, that's kind of the whole kind of motivation behind screening. And in uh, 2021, that's um, kind of the data for the incidents um, in terms of uh, the number of invasive cancers, in situ cancers, and deaths. And uh, among US women, the most common cancer after skin cancer is breast cancer. Um, the second leading cause of uh, cancer death um, behind lung cancer. And it's uh, the leading cause of death in women from 35 to 54 years old. And so further numbers uh, behind screening. Um, the reason to do it is, um, you know, the earlier, Prognosis gives you earlier diagnosis would give you better prognosis. Um, 
you want to catch the cancer while it's small and hasn't spread. Um, as you can see, once it starts spreading, um, your prognosis gets worse in terms of your survival starts to go down. So if it's just in the breast, your survival's, you know, that's our goal is, is, is very good, 98.6%. Once it gets to uh, kind of regional disease, like 80, your, your survival's still good at 83.8%, but once it goes distant, you know, lungs, bone, your prognosis and, uh, is not as good survival of 23.3%. Uh, so currently over 2.8 million breast cancer survivors in the United States. Um, so breast cancer, it's uh, an exciting era in breast cancer care. Um, there's a lot of advancements. Um, you know, uh, when I did fellowship uh, seven years ago, and even right now there's, uh, you know, emerging technologies uh, such as, uh, you know, contrast enhanced mammography. Um, there's, you know, instead of placing wires prior to surgery for localization, there's now uh, mag seeds, radio seeds, um, savvy scout seeds. So there's a continued advance. It's a very exciting field. Uh, and so um, early detection um, is kind of the goal again, uh, always uh, to improve outcome uh, with all the technologies. So um, this is kind of just a chart here. Um, as uh, you know, it's best to catch this cancer as uh, soon as possible to help your survival. So lymph node metastases, uh, you know, once the cancer gets bigger and bigger, that's more likely for it to uh, spread to the, you know, axilla. Um, when you get breast cancer, the first place to look uh, in terms of spread is uh, the axilla, and so. You know, once the cancer gets to about two centimeters, there's a 20% 20 20 risk of lymph node spread. So, you know, our goals are to, uh, you know, catch this cancer before it gets that big. Uh, you know, we're often catching cancers, you know, um, one centimeter or less. So uh, that's the whole goal of screening. And so in terms of um, kind of uh, incidents here, um, you know, it's uh, highest in whites. And in terms of uh, mortality, it's uh, highest in African Americans, and um, you know it's uh, not sure exactly you know why that is the reason. It could you know you know uh, be that there could be more aggressive cancers in African Americans, uh, and in addition, it could be uh, you know lack of access uh, to uh, breast cancer screening. Um, So breast cancer, uh, why screen? Uh, again, you know, one in eight women lifetimes. So it's a high prevalence. Uh, you have improved outcome by treatment early uh, before you become symptomatic. So we want to catch this cancer before a woman can even feel it. Uh, uh, you know, she's, we want her to come for screening mammograms yearly and uh, to detect it before she's even feeling a lump in her breast. Uh, and so um, the screening program has a significant impact on public health. And so, um, I mean, studying uh, screening mammography, it kind of dates back, uh, you know, very, very, very far back in terms of studies to prove, uh, you know, how useful it is. Uh, it was uh, 1973 here that um, showed a 30% mortality reduction. Uh, that's the goal um, is uh, to decrease mortality. Many other studies uh, through the years here. Um, so it's been well studied. Uh, uh, mem screening mammography. Um, and now we've gone from screening 2D, um, you know, screening mammography to 3D tomosynthesis uh, screening mammography, which kind of really helps with the detection of cancer um, and decreases callback as well with the, the 3D mammograms. So um, advances in the field, but basically screening mammograms are um, a very useful tool to uh, help uh, reduce mortality. Um, so there's been large randomized controlled trials to support um, screening mammography and uh, many meta-analyses um, kind of to, to prove that point. So in the age group of 50 to 69, the mortality reduction is 16 to 35 uh, percent. From 40 to 49 years old, the mortality reduction is 15 to 20 percent. And, you know, it, it looks lower in the 40 to 49 because, you know, it's a lower incidence in a younger age group. The older you get, the more likely you're to get breast cancer. And um, 
it's the mortality reduction is less also in the younger group because the younger you are, you know, usually the cancers are more aggressive. So they're rapidly growing tumors and, uh, you know, uh, more, more lethal. And uh, also the younger population uh, is more likely to have dense breasts. So um, they could, you know, make it harder for you to detect the breast cancer on a screening mammogram. So that's why even though, uh, you know, there's mortality reduction in, you know, anyone from 40 to 69 and even older, it's uh, the mortality reduction is less than uh, the 40 to 49 year old group for those reasons. Uh, again, the mortality reductions due to detection of the cancer at a small size at early stage. Um, you want to catch it um, when it's mammographically visible three to five years before it becomes palpable. And, um, and also uh, you want to detect a DCIS. So, you know, kind of the earliest stages of cancer is DCIS. It's considered a stage zero. So, you know, uh, if we can catch, and that usually resents as calcifications, if we can catch that. Um, you know, that's the earliest stage. And then, you know, after DCS, there's invasive ductal carcinoma, that's a mass. And we want to catch those masses early before they get too big and spread to the lymph nodes and the axilla uh, and beyond. So, um, you know, it's not just lead time bias. There's actual uh, mortality reduction. It's not that we're just diagnosing them earlier. Um, we're able to diagnose them earlier and reduce mortality. So um, early stage disease is curable. Um, that's the whole point. Uh, in terms of the accuracy of screening mammography, um, the sensitivity in women greater than 50, 98% uh, um, uh, for fatty breast and then 84% for dense breast. And so with fatty breast, um, basically on the mammogram, everything's black. And on you know, dense breast, everything is white. And cancer um, you know, masses, they're white. And so um, in dense breast, which is also white, it would hide itself. And so that's why the sensitivities um, you know, lower in dense breast. Uh, and the specificity is high uh, at 82 to 98% uh, for screening mammography. So today we're talking about screening mammography and BIRADS. Uh, and uh, what's the difference between screening versus diagnostic mammography? So uh, screening mammography, um, patients have no symptoms. Um, they're coming in uh, yearly uh, to just get mammograms. They have no problems. Uh, a diagnostic um, mammogram is when they have problems. They're coming with a lump in their breasts. We see patients uh, for breast pain, uh, for nipple discharge. And uh, when they come in with problems or they come back because they had an abnormal screening, that's when we consider it a diagnostic mammogram, which includes additional views, um, is spot magnification, close-up views um, of the area of interest. Uh, So again, the diagnostic uh, mammogram is different because the patient will have you know, breast signs or symptoms uh, or they're being called back from an abnormal screening mammogram. And diagnostic mammograms are you know, under the supervision of the radiologist. Uh, screening mammogram, oftentimes, uh, you know, many screening mammograms are done. Uh, they're read within 30 days. Uh, usually we do read them all on the same day, but uh, in terms of the requirements by the um, FDA, the you know, the US uh, Federal uh, Drug Administration who oversees uh, mammography uh, requires uh, every screen mammogram to be read in 30 days, but uh, typically, um, you know, uh, they'll be read, in, you know, within, you know, the same day at the end of the day. So screening mammography consists of two images of each breast, the craniocaudal view and the uh, medial lateral oblique view. So um, this is, um, craniocaudal uh, view here, and that's, you know, how the image is taken, um, kind of the, um, the radiation beam and then the detector um, and producing that image. And uh, for the MLO view, this is how the MLO view is obtained and what it looks like. And so for screening mammogram, well, each breast, you'll have those two views. So here's a, a mammogram of fatty breast here. That's the craniocaudal view, uh, the CC view. And uh, that's the uh, MLO view, mediolateral oblique view. Um, so these are what you'd consider fatty breasts. You can see basically uh, it's all black. Uh, in contrast to uh, a dense breast um, where um, the breasts are very white. Um, 
And so this is the craniocaudal projection of uh, a uh, dense breast, and that's the mediolateral oblique uh, view of uh, dense breast. And as you can see, it's very white and cancer masses would be white and would hide in that. So, um, you know, when it all started, it started with film screen mammography, and then, you know, now it's moved to uh, digital mammography. And um, it's also moved beyond just uh, 2D digital mammography, but to 3D digital mammography, which is tonal synthesis. Um, so kind of the spatial resolution of uh, digital mammography um, versus a, you know, film screen mammography is, uh, is less, um, not by much, but the reason digital um, is better than a film screen uh, mammography is that there's greater image contrast. So it's helpful in areas with, uh, you know, low, um, you know, contrast on the film screen. So it's very helpful in dense breasts, which we, you know, have, uh, it could be difficult reading those dense breast uh, mammograms. So, you know, uh, digital mammography helps in that area. And uh, it also, uh, it's able, you're, you're able to manipulate image to optimize, optimize the image. So with the contrast the brightness and magnification. So those are all the benefits and why we, you know, kind of move from film screen to digital mammography. Um, when I was a medical student, uh, we used to actually have, you know, you know, you know, hard copies of films, and we would hang them up uh, on a light box, and uh, every morning, and uh, um, you know, imagine all all the work that took. Also, and now, um, you know, as technology's gotten better, it's digital mammography, and we don't have to kind of hold like you know, kind of these original copies of films and hang them up on a light box anymore. So, on mammogram here, this is an example of uh, what cancer would look like. Um, you know, again, I said it, you know, the mass would be white, and there it is. And, you know, it's not an oval mass, um, but it's an irregular mass with speculated margins. And so that's you know, words that you would hear uh, in terms of a descriptor uh, for breast cancer. And so you can see masses uh, on mammograms and you can also see calcifications on mammograms. And, um, so masses, uh, when they're biopsied, uh, and they're abnormal, typically come back as invasive ductal carcinoma, IDC. and um, you know, I used to, you know, quite, you know, wonder, of, um, you know, IDC, in, in invasive ductal carcinoma, infiltrating ductal carcinoma, what's the difference? It's, it's, it's basically the same um, when you hear the words IDC, invasive ductal carcinoma, infiltrating ductal carcinoma. Um, it's basically this uh, mass in the breast. And I used to wonder, well, it's called invasive ductal carcinoma. Does it mean it's spread everywhere else? It doesn't mean it has spread everywhere else, but, you know, um, these... IDCs and base of ductal carcinomas are the ones that do spread um, to, um, you know, the lymph nodes and the armpit. And, uh, you know, in contrast to calcifications uh, that are biopsy, they come back as, uh, you know, ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS. In situ means kind of localized, and, you know, and usually um, calcifications, ductal carcinoma in situ, those are usually localized and don't spread, um, you know, to the armpit, uh, lymph nodes. Um, it's usually considered a uh, stage zero cancer. And so it's a paper in a New England journal um, from 2005 here uh, talking about how digital um, mammography, its performance uh, compared to film screen mammography, which uh, we've gone over. So um, basically we, we use uh, digital mammography, not film screen. and. Uh, Again, it's very helpful um, in dense breasts. And so, you know, less than 50 year old, the younger the patients, usually the breasts are denser. And so dense breasts, uh, you know, uh, D3 or D4 means uh, basically, there's actually four densities. I talk about fatty breasts and dense breasts, but when I talk about fatty breasts, it consists of what we call D1 and D2, which is fatty breasts and scattered fibroglandular densities. And D3 and D4, um, you know, our dense breasts. D3 stands for heterogeneously dense breast, and uh, uh, D3 is heterogeneously dense breast, and D4 is extremely dense breast. And uh, in the uh, pre uh, or perimenopausal, um, you know, women, and so again, the, the younger women, uh, relatively younger women, they're gonna have dense breasts. And so digital mammography is, um, you know, helped with that. So um, for screening mammogram, what do we look for? 
as you uh, have seen on the last slides, we look for masses, calcifications, and there's some other findings you can see as well. So here's a, a case um, of a 51-year-old um, screening uh, mammogram. And um, there's a craniocaudal view and the mediolateral oblique view. So just take a kind of a second to look and see if um, you think there's anything abnormal about the mammograms. So I'll say when I read a mammogram, uh, what you're looking for is, um, you know, something that's unique, something that, um, you know, stands out, um, you know, that's not, you know, like, for example, if a person had a lot of masses in both breasts, uh, you, you, you're not gonna, you know, evaluate every mass, but you're gonna look for the unique one and, uh, and deal with it. So if, you know, when I look at a mammogram, I'm looking for something that's unique, um, and uh, that's that's what I'm that's what I'm looking for in terms of search pattern is you're looking for something that's unique and so you have the left and right there and you're looking for something that stands out. Um, so it's the left breast um, in which you know um, again remember I said like uh, masses of cancer they're often white so oftentimes we're looking for the whitest area in the breast as well that if that stands out and is unique so it's the left breast that there is a you know uh, an irregular spiculated mass. And so, you know, if we look at the screening mammogram and we say, hey, there's something abnormal on the left breast, and we call them back for a diagnostic mammogram for further evaluation, which uh, we're getting magnification views of the area. Um, and there you can get a you know, better view of its margins there. And so in terms of, uh, you know, masses, we talk about its shape and margins. So this is an irregular mass, it's not oval, um, it's not, and then its margins, um, called the spiculated margins. Uh, so I would say this here, um, if you kept on, you know, going beyond this, you get an ultrasound, do a biopsy, that would, you know, come back as invasive ductal carcinoma, IBC. So case number two is a 47-year-old uh, for a screening mammogram. So. The last case, um, you know, the cancer we saw, you know, you could probably more easily detect it um, given it was a fatty breast, this is dense breast. And again, imagine, you know, seeing, you know, the white cancer hide in dense breast, but, you know, um, you can still see findings in dense breast. Um, so take a look at the CCV and MLO view and uh, see if there's anything of interest uh, in either breast. I think what you uh, might end up uh, looking at, or you see a, a mass here in the, in the right breast. In the left breast here, you see some calcifications. Um, you know, these calcifications, there's a, a couple of them, they're you know, benign appearing, um, they're round, punctate, and uh, you know, there's a mass here. So those are things that you could you know, further investigate with diagnostic mammogram images. So on uh, diagnostic mammogram images, uh, you see here spot compression or spot magnification views of the area. And you see, you know, this mass here, again, we're looking at its shape and margins. And here, um, you know, it looks like an oval mass and its margins, it's, um, you know, um, basically circumscribed. So those are descriptors uh, that sound benign, um, but on mammogram, you don't know what this is, is this, you know, you could think is this a cyst or a solid mass like a fibrinoma, amla or you know a, a very circumscribed uh, cancer um, an oval cancer um, so you would do ultrasound of this um, to understand whether it's a solid or is it a cyst and so this is ultrasound of uh, the finding here and um, as you can see it's you know like um, you can ultrasound other areas in the body uh, you've done ultrasound and you can see this anechoic, uh, which would, you know, descriptor for assist with posterior enhancement. So that mass ends up being benign uh, assist. So what we've seen so far uh, on those first two cases uh, was masses. One, you know, one mass on the mammogram, uh, you know, 
least it was a cancer in that second mass I just showed, uh, ended up on ultrasound being a cyst. Uh, so we move on to, uh, you know, calcifications, what you can also see on screening mammograms. Uh, most are benign um, and you can dismiss them, um, but the goal is uh, to basically identify suspicious calcifications. Uh, and if they're, you know, if you have prior mammograms to compare with, if they're new or increasing, um, you know, things that you want to pay attention to. So, so it's, you know, um, you want to know what benign calcifications are, so you don't um, spend, you know, additional time on these. So if you look at these calcifications uh, here, uh, it's just something that you, you know, you should be able to recognize now. Um, this is what we call secretory calcifications. And when you see this, they're benign. You don't have to work them up. Um, they're typically described as uh, secretory calyxes, um, kind of a bunch of these uh, lines here. And uh, they're often, um, you know, often bilateral um, and scattered. But they, I've seen this happen also just in one breast in one area. And when that happens, it's a little bit more confusing. Um, these other calx here, they look very benign as well. Um, they're very round. Um, so calcifications, you have two descriptors. You know, it's, uh, it's morphology and it's distribution. The morphology here would be round and its distribution is grouped. So given that they're round, um, you know, that's benign descriptor, but the fact that they're grouped, uh, you know, makes it you know, something that you kind of want to, you know, um, give attention to. So, you know, these for the most part look benign. So this is something that I can see us following up uh, in six months to just, you know, ensure that they're stable. And, you know, once they're stable for two years, uh, we, we would call them benign. In terms of uh, suspicious calcifications. So here's the cranial caudal view and the medial lateral uh, oblique views. And so look at the left breast. You see these calcifications here, we're talking about suspicious calcifications now. So right here and right here. So suspicious calcifications, again, what, what makes them suspicious? Um, again, when we talk about calcifications, um, you know, we give it descriptors for its morphology and its uh, distribution. So um, let's see here if we have some spot Magnification views, which we do right here, spot magnification, uh, cranial caudal, and spot magnification, um, medial lateral or lateral medial uh, view here, and uh, so it's morphology here. You would describe as it varies in sizes and shapes, and you see some lines. Um, they're not just punctate, but you see some kind of linear calcs. So varying sizes and shapes. That's pleomorphic, is how you describe varying sizes and shapes. And, so pleomorphic calcifications is uh, its morphology and its distribution. It's in a linear distribution, in a line. So both of those descriptors are actually uh, suspicious uh, descriptors. Um, this linear distribution, like um, a ductal distribution, uh, which you see with the ductal carcinoma in situ, DCIS. Um, so these would be suspicious calcifications that we would recommend to biopsy. And to biopsy calcifications, uh, the way you would biopsy them, biopsy them is um, with, since you see them on mammogram, mammogram guided uh, biopsies, which uh, is called stereotactic guided biopsies. Um, and uh, let's see here, the, you know, case number five now, something else you can see on mammograms aside from masses and calcifications is called architectural distortion. So the, you know, this is a dense breast here, craniocaudal and medial lateral oblique views. And so what is circled is the abnormal area. Um, this is a, a hard finding to see. Uh, one, it's in dense breast. Um, it's really hard to see that finding. It's uh, probably hard to, harder to see on the medial lateral oblique view here. It stands out a little bit more on the craniocaudal projection here. Um, this finding is called architectural distortion. It's basically a lot of white lines radiating towards the center. And so what's causing this is typically a cancer that's pulling all the tissues in, causing architectural distortion. And typically when architectural distortion is biopsy, um, it's, it's not always cancer, but you, it's cancer until proven otherwise. So it's something you want to biopsy. 
um, something benign that it could come back as is called a radial scar. Uh, but um, until you biopsy it, um, it's suspicious. So your spot magnification views. Uh, so you can see it's very hard to see. It's uh, this area here and this area here. Very hard to see, but it's a bunch of white lines pulling toward the center space here. Um, you know, what's helped um, in terms of uh, seeing architectural distortion is actually tomosynthesis. 3D mammograms where you're going through slices. Um, you know, it's not the same technology exactly as a CT scan, but basically your you know, tomosynthesis 3D mammogram is slices through the breast. And, and that helps a lot. And uh, you can really help you see architectural distortion. That's um, architectural distortion. And, uh, and here's a mammogram of, you know, it's uh, not the densest breast, nor the, it's completely fatty. It, it, you know, again, it's a whole spectrum from D1 to D4 in terms of its density. So it's on the, I, you know, it could be on the fatty, more fatty side, but scattered fibroglandular densities here. And um, the finding is hard to see right there on the CC view. And on the MLO view, it's right there. Again, architectural distortion, very hard to see. Uh, Tomosynthesis, 3D mammograms have helped with this. Um, and there's a spot magnification views of the architectural distortion. Uh, again, you can see it better here in the magnification views. Um, you can see white lines pulling towards the center. There's some, you know, a couple calcifications of that area too. So likely involved with the cancer in that area. Uh, so the limitations of mammography, um, you know, as many as five to 15% of breast cancers are not detected by mammogram. So meaning they're false negatives. Uh, we'll read the screening mammogram, call it negative, but there's actually cancer there. And so uh, again, you know, um, screening mammography is not perfect. It does a great job, but um, it's not gonna catch everything. Um, so, a negative mammogram should not deter you from workup if you know there's something clinically worrisome. So, for example, if a, a patient comes with a lump in the breast and you look on the mammogram and it's negative, we still go to ultrasound to make sure that uh, when we ultrasound that palpable area, there's actually not a mass hiding in there. Um, and so, why are you know why do we get false negatives um, when we read a mammogram? Uh, you know, it could be a Colton mammogram. Um, you know, invasive globular carcinoma is actually something that's very hard to detect on mammogram because um, it just doesn't show up very well often. And so that's why, you know, we can miss it. And, um, you know, again, dense breast tissue, um, cancers are white, uh, the masses, and they could hide in the dense breast tissue causing a false negative. Um, it could be um, just technical being the technologist kind of, um, maybe didn't you know, include far posterior breasts and it wasn't included in the image. And uh, just an area interpretation um, you know, by the radiologist. So mammogram, uh, there's radiation, uh, but it's extremely low, the amount of radiation. So just to, you know, uh, comparing um, you know, risk of death from uh, radiation, uh, it's um, you know, much less than all these other activities here that people do. So the radiation from mammogram, uh, in terms of uh, millisieverts, uh, there you go, uh, a 2D mammogram, uh, 0 0.5 millisieverts. And then if you do 3D mammogram and you're actually getting the 2D plus the 3D, it's one millisievert, so not much more uh, when you're getting 3D mammogram. And um, just, you know, just to get a relative idea of that, it's three millisieverts uh, for Americans, just, uh, just from normal, exposure from background radiation. And if you live in uh, uh, Denver, uh, Colorado, U United States, uh, it's four millisieverts uh, when you live in uh, kind of a, in this small high city higher up. Uh, so there's um, kind of a, a graph, uh, bar graph showing you kind of uh, the amount of radiation. Uh, the point is that it's a low amount of radiation uh, to get a screening mammogram. And if you want to compare millisieverts uh, with other kind of uh, radiology studies, um, you can see it's very low. Um, 
there you go with CT abdomens and um, 10 millisieverts and um, X-ray of the spine, 1.5 millisieverts. You see uh, CT of the head, two millisieverts. So a chest CT, seven millisieverts. And uh, so just kind of uh, gives you something relative uh, to understand how much radiation is happening when you're getting a screening mammogram. And some, uh, some more comparison uh, radiation doses here. And you know, you go to the airport now and they use uh, backscattered scans, um, which uh, you know, people wonder if that's a lot of radiation. And there's not much radiation. Uh, also, when you go through the airports, so something that, you know, um, to be aware of uh, as you kind of go through the airports now. Uh, but that was interesting. So I got a slide on that. Um, and so we're talking about screening today, as well as uh, BIRADS. Um, BIRADS uh, stands for Risk Imaging Reporting and Data System. It, um, you know, this, you know, BIRADS helps uniformity of reports, it's very helpful. And um, basically um, it's very helpful in terms of uh, the uniformity and it's very clear in terms of uh, giving guidance um, to the referring or ordering provider, what's the next step. So um, for BIRADS now, um, BIRADS one and, and two is basically, you know, kind of similar in terms of, uh, you know, the management, right? It's, it's, if it's negative or a benign finding like a benign, um, you know, um, finding like a benign intramammary lymph node or benign, you know, calcifications and um, BIRADS two. BIRADS one and two both uh, is, you know, get a yearly screening mammogram, it's negative and you, re you return to getting yearly mammograms. And uh, so the next is BIRADS three, which is a finding that you, you know, um, you're not that worried about it. Um, and you don't want to put the patient through a biopsy. Um, one, because, uh, you know, you don't want to do something invasive unless you have to. Uh, and two, cost a procedure would cost more than following up with the, you know, further imaging. And typically you follow up, um, you know, you know, for two years uh, at six months and then another six months at the one year mark, and then in 12 months um, for two years stability. Um, you know, if at any point, you know, you just you know, figure it out to be benign, like say in six months you follow up and hey, you decided to cyst, you can also stop following up. Uh, it doesn't have to go out for two years, but uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, say like a fibrinoma, uh, something that looks benign, seen on ultrasound, you typically follow up uh, six months, six months, and, 12 months for two years stability. Uh, BIRADS four and five are, you know, again, sent, you know, could be grouped in terms of management um, is a biopsy is gonna get recommended. So um, it's just a BIRADS five is, you know, a higher level of suspicion, which for the most part is you believe it's cancer, um, over 95% chance that it's going to be cancer. And BIRADS six is, um, what you classify it after it's you know been biopsied and you have the pathology and the management of that is uh, you're going to see a breast surgeon and uh, oncology team to to manage. Uh, so in summary, um, screening mammography is it's it's not perfect um, you know, uh, but it's the only screening test at this point uh, proven to decrease uh, breast cancer uh, deaths. Um, you know, with the long history of um, multiple randomized control studies. And uh, it's gonna remain the primary screening test. Uh, in addition, you know, it's advanced from 2D screening to uh, 3D mammograms, uh, tomosynthesis. Um, and uh, I, also, I also see MRI as being an additional, you know, helpful tool with uh, mammogram, in addition to mammogram for screening and uh, in high risk populations for sure. And uh, it's possible to, even use that in the future, um, you know, going to something that's called abbreviated MRIs where less sequences are taken and can be done faster, um, you know, possibly in dense breast populations. Um, uh, let's see, so, you know, uh, in the USA, um, they have a mam Mammography Quality Standards Act. Um, it's regular, mammography is uh, regulated by the government and there's laws which establish, you know, quality standards um, administered by the uh, FDA, which is the Federal Drug Administration. And they um, accredit and certify all uh, mammography providers. So 
uh, within radiology, it's uh, the most you know kind of regulated um, you know kind of area. Well, probably another area that's more regulated would be nuclear medicine. Uh, and this was signed into action in uh, 1992, um, and then it revised in 1999 in the United States. And um, just uh, you know, in terms of screening guidelines, uh, uh, ACR is American College of Radiology, and uh, ACOG is the American College of Obstetrics uh, and Gynecology. And so uh, the guidelines for screening average risk women, so um, women that have basically one out of eight women lifetime, that's your average, that's the average risk woman. Um, we recommend annual screening mammograms at age 40. Um, because of reduction of mortality. Um, and CBE is a clinical breast exam. And uh, the recommendation there is uh, at age 40 also uh, for the annual clinical breast exams. Uh, and self breast exams, they, they can help. Um, and what the American College of Rec uh, Radiology recommends is that, you know, um, that women are just aware of their breast and, uh, and uh, are able to, um, you know, kind of tell if there's something different or new and, uh, have that investigated, um, you know, uh, further if there's, they're, you know, noticing a new lump in their breast. So there's, again, a lot of different organizations for clinical breast exams and self breast exams. The uh, American Cancer Society, um, you know, there's all these varying kind of recommendations. They don't, they don't recommend clinical breast exams and self breast exams. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, uh, there's clinical breast exams and self-breast exams. Uh, you know, there's reported lumps in the breast, but they're actually just normal breast uh, kind of tissue, uh, kind of lumpy breast. And so, um, but they, you know, American um, Cancer Society still recommends that women are familiar uh, with their breasts and notice changes and report them. Uh, the United States uh, Task Force, um, they say clinical breast exams are, there's insufficient uh, data to say whether it benefits or harms. And, they actually discourage, um, with, you know, self breast exams. Uh, my personal opinion is actually, you know, what I've seen is uh, most of the time the patients with self breast exams are, you know, when they say there's something, there's usually actually something in clinical breast exam. It kind of varies on kind of the providers. What I've noticed, if it's a breast surgeon or someone that's more familiar with the exam, um, that specializes in it, usually they're kind of more accurate with theirs. So um, it, 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 there's a lot of variability. Um, with clinical and self breast exams. Uh, uh, the American College of Radiology screening guidelines for high risk patients now, um, you know, uh, someone with a first degree relative or they have the, the BRCA um, gene, um, meaning they're over 20% lifetime risk is to, you know, start yearly screening by age 30 uh, or 10 years earlier. Um, you know, they should get screening 10 years earlier um, than when, you know, their relative would diagnose. So if their mom or sister was diagnosed at breast with breast cancer at age, you know, say 42, they should start getting, you know, screening at uh, age 32, 10 years earlier. Um, there's different uh, models to calculate your lifetime risk. Um, there's some called the Gale model. You can Google all of this or the Tyra Cusick model. Uh, I've noticed uh, our clinicians would use the Tyra Cusick model. Um, that model, you know, takes into account more factors and can get you to lifetime risk of 20% and over, um, you know, quicker and easier. And, and when you have that, you know, um, the insurance companies are, you know, are, you know, going to kind of pay for that. And so it helps, you know, women get the MRI um, because when they are considered high risk, you know, then they qualify for, you know, additional kind of uh, more powerful screening tools um, in addition to a uh, mammogram being the, you know, breast MRI. Um, and so people that can also, you know, get screening earlier, high-risk patients, such as women that have had radiation for, you know, um, you know cancer at a young age, like lymphoma um, in the chest, and they got radiation. And with the radiation, they're higher risk uh, of getting breast cancer. Um, other, um, you know, Women that fall in this high risk uh, category, are women with prior biopsy proven uh, lobular neoplasia, you know, atypical ductal hyperplasia and ductal carcinoma in situ, or, uh, you know, previously biopsy breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Um, and so, um, again, yearly screening, and again, it would be with uh, mammogram plus, in addition, uh, a 
a breast MRI. And so um, just some different uh, guidelines uh, here. Um, this NCCN is uh, what our breast surgeons follow. Uh, And so a, a, a question that's often asked is when do you, you know, when do you stop screening? Um, and there's, again, a lot of different organizations and different recommendations, but, you know, uh, from the American College of Radiology, if you're in good health and you're willing to go, you know, you know, biopsy and treatment, then uh, the recommendation is to get the mammogram. Uh, for example, it's not a certain age. There could be a nine-year-old that, you know, looks like she's 60. And so, um, you know, if she's really in good health and, um, you know, can undergo further biopsy and treatment like chemo, then, you know, it's good to go ahead and get that mammogram. Uh, the American Cancer Society says if you're going to live 10 more years, then, um, you know, then you should get the, uh, uh, the annual mammogram still. Um, because if your life expectancy is less, you know, quality of life is important. And, you know, if you're not going to be able to undergo chemo, then why get the screening is kind of the idea there. Um, the U.S. Task Force said it's there's insufficient data for women over 75. Um, but again, I, I go by, you know, the American College of Radiology recommendation, which is not a certain age, but if they're in good health and um, can undergo further biopsy treatment, then to go ahead and continue to get that mammogram. Um, again, uh, recommend, recommendations gets confusing because uh, US Task Force, uh, they say, you know, get mammogram every one to two years. And then 2009, they said start, you know, at age 50. And uh, even the idea of getting at two years, um, I mean, there's a lot of controversy in, because there's so many different recommendations. Um, but, you know, what I, you know, basically kind of say is to get your yearly mammograms starting at age 40 um, and get them every year. I mean, there's no certain age, right? That you're gonna start getting breast cancer at age 50. I've seen breast cancer. Uh, women in their 30s and um, you know women in their 30s and 40s if you're going to wait to 50 I mean you know it's important to help these women in their 30s and 40s you know um, young moms and um, you know the younger they are you know also the more aggressive the cancer so um, I don't think you know waiting to 50 is a good idea uh, neither is uh, doing them every two years um, I, I basically tell patients you know you could have cancer today but I'm not able to see it on the screening mammogram it's just uh, you know, below my threshold to see it. And so then if you wait two years, well, you've given, um, you know, the cancer a chance to, to grow for two years now. So, um, you know, we recommend mammograms at age 40 and every year. Um, but there's, you know, all these recommendations out there, um, you know, um, where starting later and um, longer intervals. And so I explain kind of my stance on it, but, you know, it is very controversial for those reasons, and uh, I tell my sister to do it uh, at age 40 and every year. So start age 40, not age 50. Um, and the American College of Radiology, you know, in 2014 did say, you know, uh, to counter what the US task force uh, recommendations were to start later and two, every two years was that, you know, 6,500 additional women each year in the US would die from breast cancer if you followed the, the US task force recommendations. Um, you know, a lot of the, you know, kind of some people think that, you know, the U.S. task force's interest is to have people start later because then, you know, you don't have to spend as much, um, you know, government funding on it. So it's kind of more of a cost savings as opposed to uh, being concerned about kind of um, the women's uh, breast health. So American College of uh, American Cancer Society screening for high risk, they recommend a screening mammogram um, earlier, so 10 years earlier um, than when, you know, your first degree relative was diagnosed with breast cancer. And as I said, in addition, the breast MRI, um, because the breast MRI is very sensitive as we talked about with mammograms, you can still miss breast cancer, but the breast MRI is so powerful, you know, it's so sensitive that you basically don't miss breast cancer if they have it. So, um, you know, why not do screening MRI on everyone is because it's expensive and, you know, it's time consuming getting all those images and, you can't do that feasibly on everybody, um, but someone that's high risk, um, you know, that's what it's being reserved for now. But uh, if we can get to doing them faster and, you know, having it become, you know, more affordable or insurance reimbursements, then it's something that can, uh, you know, really help out in, you know, dense breast populations. Uh, 
So screening Bresomar is an important new tool, uh, not so new anymore. The idea of abbreviated Bresomar, MRI, kind of uh, um, you know making them lesser sequences and doing them faster is kind of kind of what's newer and you know you know some places are starting to do, and uh, something that we want to do also at Baylor. Um, Again, screening breast MRIs are very effective because of high sensitivity, uh, unlikely to miss anything on a breast MRI. Breast MRI for high-risk screening this is the greatest opportunity to improve early detection. Uh, multiple studies on the efficacy of uh, adding MRI and you know, detecting breast cancer. Um, so we do them in you know, gene mutation carriers, um, they have over 20% lifetime risk, uh, you know, with family history. And the sensitivities, as you can see, comparing, you know, you know, technologies here, mammogram, breast ultrasound, MRI. See, the sensitivity for MRI is very high, um, you know, I'd say close to 100%, much higher than the others. So mammogram, ultrasound, you could miss breast cancer. Uh, MRI, you're highly unlikely to, so. Uh, in addition to mammogram, when you're high risk, the MRI is uh, the great tool to use for screening. Uh, the primary benefit of MRI is, uh, again, extremely sensitive. Added average cancer yield by MRI alone is uh, 22 out of 1,000 patients. Um, so just some um, you know, cases to show you breast MRI is uh, screening. So 63 year old is uh, someone that's high risk because they have the gene. Um, they also had a personal history of breast cancer on the left. Um, mammograms were negative. The screening MRI shows you there in the left, you know, the enhancing cancer. So breast MRI extremely sensitive. Again, the MRI showing the enhancing, uh, you know, irregular mass there, that's invasive ductal carcinoma. Now the limitations of the, the, the breast MRI, again, is expensive and it's, um, it's availability. Um, so also this, you know, the reason you also don't wanna do it on everyone is um, the specificity is lower than mammograms. So, you know, you can, you know, you know end up seeing a lot of things that are, are nothing, um, end up, you know, doing biopsies that are benign. So, you know, you could have um, you know those false positives where they're not they're, they're not cancer, but you see some finding on MRI and get biopsies, and so that's kind of a you know you know a reason you don't want to do it on everybody. Um, and then the limitation of availability, uh, you know, um, you need experienced radiologists, um, you know, to read them well. So um, you know, breast fellowship trained radiologists, and uh, and then a lot of places they do the MRI but don't have the you know, uh, capability to do MRI guided biopsies. So those are some limitations of, uh, you know, not every place doing them. So, you know, we went over five questions at the beginning and now we'll go over the answers. And uh, after the presentation, you should be able to answer them if uh, you didn't get them right in the beginning. So um, which statement about breast cancer in the US is most correct? Um, so one in eight women will, lifetime be diagnosed with uh, breast cancer? What percent of breast cancers do screening mammograms miss? So up to five to 15%. At the American College of Radiology, uh, what's the recommendation for the age to start annual screening mammograms? It's age 40. Uh, screening mammograms consist of how many views of each breast, so it's, uh, Two, uh, the CC view and MLO view. And which of the following can not be detected by screening mammograms? So, so the word enhancement, that's uh, something you see on breast MRIs. That's not something you can see on a mammogram. So that's an MRI finding, uh, abnormal enhancement. So that's it for kind of the screening mammograms and uh, um, uh, discussion about BIRAD. So um, I'll leave it. Um, you know, for questions now, if anyone has questions. Uh, and uh, thank you for everyone's time and attention. I know it's uh, hard to pay attention, um, you know, especially behind the you know, screen on Zoom. So uh, thank you for everyone's attention and I'll be answering any questions uh, that you have.
Well, thank you, Dr. Nguyen, for that very nice overview of uh, screening mammography and MRI indications uh, and classic imaging findings and virus descriptors. Um, as we wait for any questions that may uh, come in, um, you know, uh, I just wanted to bring up the point that you did. Um, there are a lot of conflicting guidelines here, especially in the US on um, screening mammography, as you uh, nicely detailed. Um, and I think, yeah, it, I agree. It's very important for us as, uh, as breast imagers and radiologists to you know, give patients and providers our perspective on why we still recommend annual screening mammography starting at age 40. That's what the evidence supports. And even though the incidence of breast cancer may be lower in you know, patients in their 40s, when they do get cancer, it tends to be more aggressive, as you said. Um, and uh, are you seeing, um, you know, since the, these conflicting guidelines came about, have you been seeing any increase in patients um, that kind of have that question of, of when to start screening and how often? Um, just uh, wanted to see in, in you, you know, uh, practice. Uh, in my experience, the patients, uh, they still want to get screening mammograms at age 40. Mm -hmm. um, they, they feel that the recommendations are, you know, you know, not in their best interest that are motivated by more financial reasons. Right. Um, and our breast surgeons and our, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 OB-GYN doctors, mm -hmm. uh, they still recommend um, screening mammograms at age 40. And so um, it's it's been helpful in that way. But I'd say uh, there's some, you know, uh, you know, residents that are trained uh, in family medicine or um, that I've noticed that they'll start recommending at age 50. I think they're, you know, right. you know, they're interested in, um, you know, what the U.S. task force recommendations are. But from mm -hmm. a patient standpoint and from us, our breast surgeons or our OB-GYN doctors, uh, they, they, they want to go at age 40 and they go every year still. So, um, you know, uh, it's been right. okay, actually. It, uh, all the, mis I would call, I guess, misinformation or different information has, um, you know, it, it hasn't really deterred women. Um, women really are, you know, you know, they're in tune with their health and uh, mm -hmm. they want kind of early screening. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I think it's also important to note that uh, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, you know, they made it a point not to have um, an expert in breast health on their panel to avoid uh, any kind of bias, but I think it kind of put them at a disadvantage and, you know, kind of looking at all the evidence as a whole and coming um, to what we obviously think is the right decision as, as starting at age 40 and on an annual basis. Um, um, well, you know, that was a wonderful talk. Um, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for your attention. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone that uh, this webinar is recorded and will be available on demand on the Health for the World website. Um, and uh, again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Friday. Thank you. Thanks.